you will, turn back in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. Of course, you can follow me in your outline as well. Your pastor's commentary will suffice to track with me as we make our way through the third analysis of the church at Laodicea and uh, seek to ascribe glory to God for his, his uh, indefatigable labor through Christ to draw us to himself. What I've stated before is that the way to properly understand at least this inaugural vision of Christ and the church, that's the way the book of Revelation opens up. The inaugural vision is that primary vision of Christ walking through the seven golden candlesticks. And for the people of God that really want to benefit from the apocalypse, the revelation, the bookends of Revelation chapter 2 and 3, Christ walking through the seven churches to do for her what she needs and frequently what she cannot do for herself is also consummated by Revelation chapter 22, 17, where the text says, and the spirit and the bride say, come, and the spirit and the bride say, come. It would, it would be a legitimate conclusion to draw that that woman in Revelation 22, 17 has passed all of the rigors of the test in challenges. Do we got somebody on the, on the, on the screen up there? Revelation uh, 22, 17, please. That, that woman in Revelation 22, 17 will have passed the rigors of what takes place in chapters two and three. I want to be that woman. I want to be the woman that corresponds with Jesus Christ by his spirit to call the world to the water of life to drink freely and to live, a wonderful metaphor that we'll get to when we get there. But what a wonderful occupation. And the spirit and the bride say what? Come. And let him that is a thirst say come. And let him that is a thirsty come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. That is that heavenly merchandising motif that we have where the wife corresponds with her husband by the spirit to do the task of calling rebel sinners to himself. What a beautiful, beautiful depiction of the closing out of the apocalypse, that we would be co-laboring together with God and calling men and women to the water of life. And that would close out, if you will, the, uh, the end of time and usher in the final state. But we are in the third chapter, and we're going to be looking at verses 14 through 17 under the title, The Church at Laodicea. I'm sorry, this is not even the one that I want to work with here. So the church at Laodicea recovering from a false narrative. Let me recover my notes so I'm not on two different pages with you guys. Recovering from a false narrative. Now I want us to really work through this idea of recovering because what we find in verse 18 is really going to be the heart of our discourse today, as I stated earlier. The way verse 18 opens up is that Christ gives the church at Laodicea a proposition, and that is counsel. Notice how he opens up in Revelation 17, Revelation 3, verse 18. I counsel you. I counsel you. And I want to drill down into that concept with you just a little bit. I counsel you. I want to press that home for a moment with you. This is coming from the Lord Jesus Christ, who has already labored with this church, has he not, to not only reveal his own attributes of being a faithful witness and a, a, uh, a, the amen and certainty of God's purpose and will uh, in our lives, and then also to be the firstborn uh, prototokon, if you will, of our existence. That is to say, we only have life because of him. And if you meet somebody who is viewed in God's eyes and therefore yours as being a faithful witness wouldn't you be inclined to listen to him? If he's a faithful witness and you, you can't find fault with him and you recognize that, as the proverb puts it, a faithful witness delivers souls. I'm inclined to listen to him. And what our Lord is doing here is he's speaking to the church at Laodicea who is presently operating out of a false narrative a false identity and trapped by assumptions about herself that are not true. And what he has already done in verse 17 is laid out to her clearly that your ego, I me, I am this and I am that is wrong. 
he's clearly laid out to her that she's been operating out of a delusion. That notions of herself as being rich is a patent lie. But the idea that her wealth will continue on into eternity, which is the, the grammar context there in verse 17. I am rich and increased in goods. What was the false assumption that she bought into that led her to believe that she would never ever find herself in want or in need of anything? How delusional can you be? But Christ had to help her with that delusion. And she says, I have need of nothing. And you remember what he said. He said, no, in fact, quite frankly, everything you thought about yourself is exactly the opposite. Now, children of God, that's what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Two, verses 3 through 7 is a strong delusion that they might believe a lie that they might all be damned who did not have a love for the truth that they might be saved and so men and women are walking around in false narratives false identities of themselves boasting of things that are not true that's bad enough to be deluded by your own bs And you're really instricably bound by that when you are part of the dark kingdom, right? When you're part of the dark kingdom, not only will you lie to yourself, you will buy that lie and you can't be delivered from it. The whole world lieth in the lap of the wicked when First John chapter 5, verse 18. That means that Satan is constantly sprinkling dust in your eyes to keep you blinded that first john chapter first corinthians chapter second corinthians 4 4 right the god of this world has blinded them that believe not so they're perpetually being blinded by falsehoods and lies and you and i were there at one time and god had mercy on us and by the grace of god he revealed to us our wretchedness and that list he lays out in chapter 3 verse 17 where he lays out and makes it very clear that no, you're not rich and you're not increased in goods and you're not such as need nothing. Verse 17, please. Your problem is actually this, that you are wretched. And we worked that through last week, didn't we? That's a bad problem for a person. That's being filled with stores from being beaten so badly that you wish you could die because you're under a punishment of capital, uh, under the guilt of capital punishment. That's the way that language was used in that day. Often before people were killed, they were tortured. And the idea is being tortured to the point of filling yourself as wretched. And really what he's talking about is the conscience of the man or the woman that lives in rebellion to the reality of God and then have to face God in judgment. The big thing about eternal damnation is the conscious awareness of the torment of having lived perpetually in rebellion against the light. Christ really is being eschatological here. He's really actually painting a picture to the church at Laodicea of what it looks like when you stand before God on the last day, not having been redeemed. Wretched. And then he says, and miserable, and we talked about that. To be miserable means to be without mercy. The man or the woman that is without mercy is miserable, and they, don't, they can't find it anywhere, and they need it, but they can't find it. And then being poor. Wretchedly poor. He's speaking of spiritual poverty here, is he not? He's, just, he's saying the individual that's spiritually poor doesn't even know that they are bankrupt spiritually. And then he says blind. And of course, the ultimate one, which is in psychology, one of the greatest fears we have is the fear of being what? Exposed. Naked. And this is where the narrative of the Genesis account lays out the pattern of Adam and Eve having sinned against God and finding themselves what? Naked. And the motif that God lays out all through the New Testament is where we're going in our text for today. But it's really important for you and I to know how one can go from being naked to being clothed. And the way it lays itself out in the scriptures is counsel. After Christ lays out her condition, and he doesn't assert to us anything as to whether or not she believes it. He just lays it out. That's what you do in preaching. In preaching, you simply tell people they're sinners. Your job is not to convince them that they're sinners. It's just to let them know, hey, this is our problem. All right? Now, if you want the solution, draw near, let's talk about it, because this is where the word counsel comes in to play. Verse 18, please. I counsel you. 
Now, we know that term, counsel, because that term is used as a mediating mechanism whenever there's a breakdown in relationships. Whenever there is a conflict of interest between two parties, whether those parties are in a domestic situation like being married, or whether those parties are in a business situation like on a job, or whether those parties are in some kind of contractual situation, whatever that may be, there's a whole litany of things where you have to have a mediator to come in to actually facilitate the grievance, right? In this context, counsel is the idea of Christ putting in enough energy to this bride of his who has lost her way to tell her to come and sit at the table with him. I want you to see the nobility of, of Christ as a husband. because we, we will frequently deal with the husband and wife narrative because the ultimate paradigm is what? Marriage. The first one is what? Father, son. Second one, what? King, servant. The other one, husband and wife. That's the way the world is going to close in. Quite interestingly enough, I really want you to have a pen and paper to be ready to write down some counsel I'm going to give you so you guys can keep, catch up with me at the end of the week coming up. The idea of God closing out the world under the rubric and metaphor of a husband and wife makes it logical to me that in the present generation in which I'm living, that the whole world disconnected from God wants to abolish marriage so as to destroy the prophecy that the way the world closes is in the nuptial, beautiful relationship of a heterosexual relationship between a man and woman in covenant. Where God has for all eternity a bride and children and a family and the father exists and we exist with the father in unmitigated, unfettered fellowship. We can see him face to face and he can see us and we enjoy the blessed benefit of family for all eternity. I can see why the devil wants to destroy the family. He does not believe in the eternal beatific vision that God has lays out, laid out for his people. And the tabernacle of God is with man and he shall dwell with them for all eternity. That's the hope of the believer. But if we're going to get there, we got to build a bridge between our harlot whoredoms of a refusal to submit to the crown rights of King Jesus, both the unregenerate and lost, as well as folk in the church. And the way to bridge that gap is to submit to counsel. Because, see, God has a grievance against us. And we actually have a grievance against God. The world does, right? The world is angry with God. And God's angry with the world. And we got a solution, and it's called the grace of God. Bear with me. This is called counsel. Now, the only time you and I don't want counsel is when we don't want to be corrected. And this happens in marriages all the time where the husband and wife are at odds with each other. And rather than to seek to come together and sit down and do what the inference of this word counsel means, negotiate the grounds of the conflict, seek a resolution so we can go back to bearing witness truly as to what a marriage is, the twain becoming what? One flesh. In our rebel condition, we'd rather win the argument then remedy the problem and produce a reconciliation. Well, can I share something with you? You're not going to win the argument with God. You ain't winning that argument. You, and it is extremely gracious on God's part to call me to, to the table when I'm the only one on the side of the relationship tearing it up. Because certainly he's already proven to me that he has not committed anything worthy of me condemning him, right? Right? My husband is wholly harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, knew no sin, did no sin, and him was no sin at all. And he stands before the world at all times saying, prove me a sinner. But he comes to his bride and he says, the way you're acting, you're acting like I did something wrong. And frequently that's how church folk are with Christ. They act like Christ has done something wrong and they're ashamed of him. And they abandon him. And they do not wear his wedding ring. And they do not allow themselves to be clothed in the beauty of conjugal relationships so that the world knows that she's married. 
And yet watch what Christ does, because as I stated to you earlier, this is the remarkable thing about me with Christ in the book of the Revelation. He spends way more time than the bride does calling her and wooing her and speaking to her. Have you noticed in the seven churches, virtually he's doing all the talking? Have you noticed that yet? You don't get any kind of dynamic back in the seven churches narrative. It's him coming to the church at Ephesus. Hey, I love you. You got these problems. Coming to the church at Smyrna and say, hey, it's good. It's good. Keep up the good work. I got you. Come to the church at Pergamos. Y'all getting down. I know you're dwelling where the devil is, but here, watch this. Just hold on. It's going to be all right. This is a remarkable depiction of the mediator of the world spending all this energy letting you and I know we can make it if we listen to him. Don't tell me he's sitting around in some kind of uh, half careful state about you. This is called zeal that's rooted in love when he spends this kind of time coming after us in our mess. That's a real husband. I'm embarrassed at myself. Can I get an amen, brothers? I'm embarrassed. But if we're going to keep the metaphor equitable in the house, I'm embarrassed as the bride for equivocating on a confident, bold assertion to the world that I'm married to the greatest husband in the universe. And yet, you know what he does? He says, come, let us reason together. Isaiah chapter 118. This is the definition of the word before us. Come, he says, let us reason together. It'll show up at some point. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be like crimson, they shall be as wool. I want you to gather, first of all, he calls. But guess what he calls us to? Reason together. Now, there's something very important about this that I want you to get. The idea of counsel in our text does not mean that you simply sit and listen to what he says. Right, because what we're working through is a, a kind of definition of the idea of counsel, which really is referring to a mutual sitting and engaging in discourse. It does echo Isaiah chapter 118, but would you also notice that what Christ does graciously is employ a collaborative process in the church's correction, because the church is, is the church has this need, two options. It will be counseled for correction, and it will be called to repentance to avoid calamity. But both of them require the church collaborating with Christ. You know what that means? Christ is not a codependent to the believer's sinful actions. You know what a codependent pathology is? It's when someone's always seeking to rescue you and you really don't feel like you are obligated to be part of your own deliverance. Codependency is the notion that we can sin that grace may abound. What does codependency mean? It means that you're under the presumption that you are so secure in the grace of God that Jesus can make all the overtures in the world. He can call you to this and call you that, and you're going to keep living like you want to live and that somehow you'll make it to glory. So what people do in codependency relationships is make the mistake of being the savior of the person. Y'all got that? So you'll have a relationship with somebody and that person will prove themselves to be more broke than you. You broke too, but they'll prove themselves to be more broke than you. And in your feel good, watch this, you will try to rescue them. And you will take on offices that you actually are not qualified to employ in rescuing them and it will actually frustrate you. Do you know why? Because they are refusing to hold up their end of the mutual bargain of the relationship. Y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? And it gets frustrating because you really want them to join you in the success of the relationship or the endeavor. And yet they are proving themselves indifferent or careless to the process. Right. That's not what God does. And that's not what grace is. Even though people think it is grace is not you continually turning your back on Christ and living like hell. And it's all right. That's not the pattern. It's not the pattern. It's not what's even depicted in the scriptures. So when he says, I counsel you, he's calling you and I to the table. Remember what I said that that marriage is the radical, loving accountability of both persons to each other. Is that what I've stated? Marriage is a 
expression of radical, loving, what's the word? Accountability. That's why in the initial creation account where Adam and Eve fall, what does God do? He calls them to account. He brings them to the assignment and say, hey, what's going on here? And in any relationship where it's going to be healthy, the husband and the wife have to be ready to come together and sit down and reason. This is Matthew chapter 18, 15. You know it. If your brother has a fault with you, if he has a problem with you, if you find out and discover that there is some kind of legitimate art between you and him, what are you supposed to do? Go to him. Don't go to somebody else like church folk love to do. Go to him yourself. Now, this context is really a paradigm of Christ coming to us because we have sinned against him. You do know that, right? We've sinned against him. And he now is appealing to us in order to convince us that we have sinned against him. Right? Go to him. If you convince your brother, you have won him. And the gospel is designed to convince us that we've sinned. And then he has a solution in the righteousness of Christ. But it's the counsel that I want you and I to understand that is critical to it. People wonder why the believer comes to church, why the believer sits under Bible teaching, why the believer is committed to sound doctrine, why the believer is committed to deep, deep, careful Bible study, because the believer understands the radical, loving, accountability uh, nature of the relationship, that God is calling me to commune with him, that God is calling me to hear from him, that God is calling me to respond to him now that he saved me. Does remember, it's very clear that on his side of the equation, your salvation is monergistic. He did it all to save you. But once he has quickened you by his spirit, you are one with him in the life that he is, you have. And you have the capacity by the grace of God to collaborate with him. Otherwise, he would have never called you into the loving, radical accountability process of marriage. You, would, you cannot view marriage as a one-sided, energetic relationship. You guys understand what I'm saying? And, and counsel, therefore, requires the man and the woman to come to the table and be ready to be exposed for the mistakes they're making. And what our Lord has already done is laid out the litmus uh, factors concerning Laodicea. We have already stated them. And now what he wants to do is bring to the table the solutions. It's a beautiful thing. You know how it goes. You and I walk in the delusion of a false narrative. It can be for a week or a month. It can be for six months. And some people walk in false narratives for years. This is the thing that will happen in the in the. Uh, in the mystery of the gospel, frequently you and I will have that experience of initial epiphany where God reveals to us the gospel and we, we submit to the claims of Christ's grace and enjoy it. But then somewhere down the line, we just lose our mind. And no one really knows how long that tenure can be. But somewhere along the journey, God in his mercy begins to awaken you to your rebellion again. And sometimes if we are fortunate enough, and I'm going to show us the text, to be drawn into God's counsel, a revival can take place. And you'll swear you've been born again, again, which is impossible. But it feels so good. It feels like a second birth. Lord, I, you didn't save me again. No, he didn't save you again. He saved you from your rebellion again. If you should ever experience that. But what it should teach you is that he didn't save you in order for you to walk away from him in a kind of careless relationship. He saved you to enter into dialogue with him. And that's what counsel is all about. I am counseling you. The term is seen in Proverbs chapter 1. Verse 24, I'm going to walk this through you a little bit as we did earlier, just briefly. Two verses before we jump into the nature of what Christ is wanting to do for us. It's a beautiful truth. He says, because I have called you, you guys see that? Call, call. This is the thing about our heavenly husband. He will call you when you mess up. The Holy Spirit will call us, won't he? Because I have called, and you what? Now, he's giving us a real clear picture of the world. He's also helping us to understand our call as Christians. Largely, we are to call the world by the gospel, right? But we know that the world is not going to come. 
while as yet the world is lost. I have called, but you refuse. I've stretched out my hand and no man regarded it. That generally is the experience of the believer when we share the gospel with the world. Would you agree? This is why you got to share the gospel in the power of God and by a principle of faith working by love, because you can't share the gospel always expecting to have a positive outcome when you share it. You share the gospel because it's the greatest expression of love that you can render to any human being whether they accept it or not. But quite frankly, if we were to enlarging the context here, God by his spirit is not speaking to the unregenerate world. He's actually speaking to the church. The context here is of men and women who started off initially with him, but did like Laodicea, drifted away. And look at verse 25. But you have set at naught all my counsel. Do you see it? You set it at naught. And you would none of my what? What's the word? Reproof. That's what we're going to look at as we close in verse 19. As many as I love, I do what? Rebuke. And so here in this context, what we have described is, is the spirit of God calling the bride to herself for counsel and the bride is rejecting. The same language is used in Psalm chapter 50 as well. If you turn to Psalm 50, I love the way God puts this in Psalm 50. It's around verse, I'm going to start at verse 12, even though it may be a little bit further down the line. Psalm 50, you've heard these words before. They are powerful terms. And again, they don't apply to the world, they apply to the believer who seems to find himself in trouble all the time. I don't know about you, but that's true for me. And notice what he says here in, uh, in, verse, in verse 15. He says, call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you shall what? Glorify me. What a great proposition. Verse 16, but unto the wicked, God says, what have you to do to declare my statutes or that you should take my covenant in your mouth? In other words, you're letting people know and pretend that you are a believer. And yet verse 17 says, seeing that you hate instruction and you cast my words behind you. He's talking to covenant people. He says, when you saw a thief, then you what? Consented with him. And you have been partakers with adulterers. This is a really bad commentary on the state of the church in a growing apostate mode. And yet the posture of Christ is to call. Go back to our text. Let's work through point one and point two for today. The posture of Christ is to call. Remember, our thought is around counsel. Not only has he said, this is your problem. Now he's saying to us, here is the solution. And we want to work through the solutions that Christ has laid out under this notion. Point number one in our text, please. Point number one in our outline lays it out this way. The counsel of what? Completely putting on Christ. So that's his counsel. If he were talking to the Laodicea on a personal level, here's what he said. Here's your issue. You need to completely put me on. That's what you need to do completely put me on. And he's getting ready now to walk through in an itemized way what it means to put on Christ. Now that's New Testament language, is it not? Put off the old man, put on the new. Put on Christ, right? Put on as the elect of God, bowels of mercy and kindness and gentleness, right? That language is so explicit in the New Testament. The idea of putting on means to operate out of a new identity. The idea of taking off means to abandon your old identity in Adam. And the metaphor of putting on means to find yourself entering into an agreement with God so that you can adequately express what you are saying with your lips in terms of being a new creature in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a what? So the council of completely putting on Christ comes under five concepts. First, the council defined. We've already been looking at that. The council defined. Please understand that the relationship with Christ and you is one where he is perpetually counseling you. Now, in a regular, regular, in a regular husband-wife relationship, that ain't going to work. Not in the world in which I live. Wives are not going to go for husbands constantly counseling them. Here's the two reasons why. You, you, you ready for them? One is you ain't Jesus. And that's a good enough reason. We don't even need another reason behind that 
But but that's that is the fundamental reason why it won't work on a perpetual level. I don't care how much Jesus you got in you, brother. You don't have enough Jesus in you to be always counseling your wife. The second reason is that your wife is yet a sinner and she could not endure a one-sided relationship where you're always telling her what to do. The text in front of us, however, we must remind ourselves is not about you telling her what to do. It's about the development of a relationship between a husband and a wife where they have enough understanding of the radical accountability of love to come to the table to work together to solve problems. Y'all got that? that? That is gonna be the key to a good marriage. If the man has the ability, the humility, the strength, the fortitude, the integrity to say, sweetheart, let's, let's come to the table and talk. I got some issues with you, you got some issues with me, let's work it out. That's what Christ is doing right here. He's saying, let's come to the table. Let's work these things out. He laid out to her her issues. She can't have any with him because he hasn't done anything wrong. And yet this is where you and I really have to pause for a moment and go, then why is the church so messed up today? Why is the body of Christ under the metaphor of a bride behaving in such a raggedy way that for all intents and purposes, what she's saying to the world by her conduct is her husband is not adequate. Her husband is not perfect. Her husband doesn't have what is essential for the sufficiency of all her needs. So she's finding them somewhere else. Y'all with me? Right. And so the world would look at the average Christian and go, uh, Jesus must not be all that for you. Because you're going here and you're going there and you're doing this and you're seeking that advice and you're denying him all of these areas in which we should be saying to the world, Jesus is all the world to me. He is all I need. But we don't even do that. And this is where Christ is calling us back to the table. And I'm willing to sit at the table. I'm willing right now to sit at the table with Jesus by the grace of God or you. Willing to sit at the table because I live in a world where people operate out of a false narrative. I live in a world where the average individual unhinged from the true and the living God is lying about who they are. Lying about what they are, lying about their origin, lying about their essence, lying about their destiny. That's the world I live in. False narratives everywhere. And the Bible lays that out very clearly too. The whole world lies in the lap of the wicked one. And just as Christ laid out to the church at Laodicea that she's blind, the world is blind. That she's wretched, the world is wretched. That she's miserable, the world is miserable. That she's poor, the world is poor, and that she's naked. Now look, if you married to a brother and he got you walking around butt naked, we got problems, right? That cannot be the possibility for the bride of Christ. And yet what Christ is saying here is you are operating out of all of these demerits. She must have somewhere down the line abandoned the riches of Christ that would have kept her within the bounty of his blessing so that she could function as an honorable bride. Isn't that a legitimate conclusion? All right, then under point number one, I want you guys to think this through with me. The counsel of completing put, completely putting on Christ really fundamentally means that your savior is your counselor. Your savior is your counselor. With just small brackets, qualifiers, no one else is on a par with your husband as a counselor like you don't you don't make equal Jesus with the psychologist or the scientist or the philosopher or the anthropologist and certainly not the agnostic or the atheist you don't contend with the plenitude of the perfections of him who is the quintessential counselor by bringing in other counsel. This is really what has gotten the church into a whole lot of problems. We're probably guilty of listening to all kind of other counselors and not Christ.
Why would that happen, Pastor? When the Bible's explicit in Isaiah chapter 9, 6, why would it happen that the person that saves me tells me he is the counselor? For unto us a child is born, his incarnation. Unto us a son is given, his deity. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. That means he rules the world. Is he sovereign Lord? Is he Lord? And his name shall be called Wonderful. I mean, if don't nobody call him Wonderful, I call him Wonderful. You're wonderful, Lord. You're magnificent, Lord. Your beauty and your splendor are effulgent, Lord. Everything you do is marvelous, Lord. My soul marvels at God. I'm just still in love with him like a honeymoon love. I'm just infatuated with everything he has revealed to me about himself. I don't see nobody in the universe like Jesus. He's fairer than 10,000. That's how he is to me. And every day he manifests himself in his splendor as better than the best of all counselors in the universe. And here's what the text says. Not only is he wonderful, he is our what? Counselor. See it? Y'all see that? All right, so I ain't gonna spend a long time. David says, the only reason I'm not crazy and in hell is because through your precepts, O oh Lord, do I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Your testimonies are my counselors and my delight. Your statutes and your ordinances, they are my treasure. David said, the only reason I'm not in hell is because your word gives me a way out every time. The reason why I'm not crazy completely, and I didn't went a little crazy. Remember when David kind of just lost it for a minute? God brought him back. And he only does it through preaching and teaching. That's how I get brought back. I'll listen to all of the miserable counselors out there. And then here comes that word that cuts through my deceit like butter and delivers me from my conceit and delivers me from my error and delivers me from my fal falsehood. I know, O oh Lord, in faithfulness have you afflicted me that I might learn your statutes. See, so the Holy Spirit via Christ is a faithful counselor to get at me when I'm trying to run. Run from God. He's your counselor. And if you want to be able to endure this crazy world that's telling you that you should believe something else other than what your husband is telling you, you better listen to your counselor. We said it earlier, you know how people get mentally disturb and you go see a psychologist uh, and then once you really think your brain is all jacked up you go to the psychiatrist and you may be having some social problems on a domestic level and then you see a therapist right we do all that only to ultimately come to find that what I'm frequently doing is seeking a kind of codependent relationship with those pseudo saviors to put a band-aid on a gaping wound that they couldn't even see. That really is a consequence of spiritual things for which Jesus is the only counselor. Do you see that? Do you see that? Do you see that? And so what I'm saying to you is that as a believer, Jesus' counsel is sufficient to get you through the crazy of our world. You have to be careful not to be running to the world as the ultimate solution. All right. And so what he says here in our text is, I counsel you. Watch this. Verse 18, I counsel you first to buy of me. Do you see it? Buy of me. Let me make this real simple, make this real easy. The advice that Jesus has, the, the information, the resources, the answer to your problem is going to cost you something. Why? Because when you buy something that costs you little or nothing, you do not appreciate it. You cannot appreciate something for which you pay little or nothing for. That's just the psychological reality of all of us. Parents struggle with that. I've always wanted my kids to get their horse as early as possible so they can get on their own horse and ride. 
because I really didn't dig being a chauffeur and the daddy too. So, you know, you chauffeur him for a while and then it's like, this is getting old. We want you to learn how to drive, <laughs> right? You just can't wait because, I mean, that's freedom from you. And then when you do something dumb as I did, you know, you got to do that eight times. It gets old. Well, you understand? It gets old. <laughs> so you're so happy when they, when they manifest a kind of autonomy and responsibility as to be able to drive, right? So that you can release them, so that you can let them go. That maturity level is what you and I are seeking for with, with our kids. I don't want to be a codependent with our children. So then once it reaches a certain level of maturity, guess what I'm willing to do? Buy them a car. Buy them a car. And then, I'm, you know, when you driving, because I want to be off the street when you drive. <laughs> Stay with me. And when you buy them the car, the words of your daddy or your mother comes back. They're going to tear that car up. Do you know why they're going to tear that car up? Because they didn't pay for it. They, it, it. It's not possible for them to value the car. It's not possible while they didn't pay for it. Let them work and accrue their own money and buy their own car. Watch how they avoid totaling that car. Now, they're going to have accidents, but they're going to avoid totaling that car because they paid for it. And what our text is teaching us is that Christ is never giving you the riches of his grace without you in exchange for the riches of that grace. Highly values what he gives. There are two things in there that are simple to be derived from this. One is on the part of what he is giving it constitutes the value of his resources. If he's going to say to you, buy of me, on his part, he knows what he has is worth purchasing. If you respond by saying, Lord, I will buy it, on your part, you recognize the value of it. Y'all got that? The motif here is, again, derived in the merchant seller uh, pr uh, principle, and that's in Proverbs 23, verse 23. Pull that up, and let's settle this. Uh, permanently on the part of the believer when it comes to the grace of God when it comes to the gospel I'm sold on the part of the believer when it comes to the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ I want you to hear this again I'm sold the Holy Ghost has sold me on the infinite worth of Jesus Christ I'm sold he has sold me on the value of the contents of his counsel I'm sold if I had all the money in the world I would give it for Jesus Christ I'm sold I'm completely committed to buying into the proposition that if I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, I have eternal life. I'm sold. Are you? I'm like absolutely sold. Sold. Proverbs 23, 23. Buy the truth and do not what? Do not sell it. Do not sell it. And yet all through Bible history, guess what we discover? Men selling the gospel. Cain sold the gospel for a religion of works. Esau sold the gospel for a pot of vintage. Judas Iscariot sold Christ out. And it's happening in the church today, all over the world, selling out Jesus. So, so don't think that what we're talking about is a, kind of an innocuous thing. It's very important. What we're going to either do is sell him or we're going to hold to him come hell or high water. And that will all be by virtue of a revelation that reveals to you that Christ is your all and there is nowhere else to go. Amen. You got that? Christ is your all and there's nowhere else to go. So under our first sub point, I counsel thee to buy of me. Buy of me what, Lord? Go. Tried gold. Do you see that? Point number two. After uh, uh, point number, uh, yeah, point number two. The cost of the commitment to buy. We are talking about buying gold. Jesus says, "I I counsel you to buy of me gold." I I, I love this metaphor because it it runs through the Old Testament several times. You've heard it in the book of Job. Remember what Job says: "When God has tried me, I know that I shall come forth as what 
Go. That's what he says. When God is done trying me, because the believer is always going through trials in order that our faith might be proven to be authentically of God and in Christ. Does that make sense? So the trial is to try you as to whether or not your faith is authentic. Your faith being watched is now the purchasing commodity or the purchasing uh, method by which you obtain the wealth of Christ. How do I obtain the wealth of Christ? By faith. How do I hold on to him as all that I have? By faith. I buy into Christ by faith. Now, what he's talking about here is not buying the gold of your faith. You and I are not buying our faith. We're buying Christ. We're buying Christ because Christ is the one who is the gold that has been tried in the fire. Buy of me gold. So by faith, I am be believing and I'm persuaded of the sufficiency and the perfections of Jesus Christ, who is the one truly having been tried in the fire. Would you agree with that? That's the proposition here before our eyes. By a me gold tried in the fire. We looked at Isaiah chapter 28. We want to do that briefly again today. Isaiah chapter 28. Notice what God says in Isaiah 28, 16. So as we are looking at this, here's what I want you to not believe. I don't want you to believe that what Jesus is saying is, I want you to, I want you to buy faith in order that you might have my blessings. No, 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 no. He's saying, I want you to value me, who is the gold tried in the fire, and is the sum substance of everything that you need. Y'all got the difference? Critically important. And so here's what he states in verse 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, behold, I lay in what? Zion. Zion being a, a, a symbol of the what? The church. For a foundation of what? Who is that stone? Christ in is the stone. And notice the adjectives that he puts uh, in front of this. He is called here a what? Foundation stone. If you and I are persuaded by the grace of God, given the gift of faith to look at Christ as that goal that is tried in the fire, here's what we discover. He is a foundation stone to our soul. When you and I come to know Christ in the saving of our souls and the redemption of our life, guess what he becomes from you? For you, the foundation of the totality of your existence. Right. The man or the woman that is not standing on the foundation of Jesus Christ as his hope for glory is necessarily going to be turned upside down and disrupted, as we're learning in the Marxist Manifesto, disrupted. That's what's happening to people every day now. Disrupted. Disrupted. They're being tossed. Disrupted. Because their foundation was not on Christ. Disrupted. They don't know what to believe. They don't know who they are. They don't know where they came from. They don't know where they're going. Why? Disrupted. Because they were not persuaded that Christ is everything they need. I lay in Zion for a foundation of stone. He's a stone, a foundation for every true believer. In a world that's shaking all the time, the believer can stand upon the solid rock and go, Jesus is all my hope and stay. While the world is going crazy. I have set the Lord always before my face. Therefore, I shall not be what? Move. He proves himself to be my foundation stone whenever I get hit by major trials. And they, they will come and they will shake you to the core of their being, won't they? <laughs> trials will just, they will have their way in your mind and in your heart. And come, you come to discover this one reality. That if it wasn't for the grace of God anchoring me to that foundation stone, I'd be turned up to and tossed to and fro and driven crazy with the rest of this world. But somewhere down the line, God in his mercy granted me faith to believe in this foundation stone. And then he became more. He became a tried stone. Do you see that? He's not only a foundation stone for the believer, he's a tried stone for the believer. What does that mean, Pastor? That means Jesus was the one that was tried for me. Jesus was the one that endured the wrath of God for me. Jesus was the one that said yes to the Father for me. Jesus was the one that had to obey all of God's law for me. Jesus was the one that had to endure all of the carpings of men, including me, against me, against him for me. 
Jesus is a tried stone and that Jesus had to come under the weight of eternal condemnation and the wrath of God for me. He's a tried stone in that he came out on the other side of the grave for me. He's a tried stone in that this stone is the foundation of eternity because he possesses eternal life. For me, y'all follow what I'm getting at? As a tried stone, here's what I come to discover. That everything that God required of me, he fulfilled in Christ so that as my stone, there's nothing about this world's challenges, the troubles that I'm going to go through that's going to ever unhinge me from who I am in Christ. And see, I get to enjoy that narrative. In the past tense. See, it's not like he's a stone that's going to be tried. He's been tried. I told you the analogy. You know what we do in this world? This is why you, you got to be careful. We lie in this world. Don't we? You know what we do? We build things. And we say, oh, this building will stand forever. It will endure 9.8 on the Richter scale of earthquakes. Right. And as long as you don't have a trial, you can buy that lie. Here comes the trial. Three point five. The whole building collapses. And then we go, what happened? They lied. Why did we buy the lie? Because it wasn't tried. Because had it been tried before we bought it, we'd know whether they were telling the truth or not. Please hear me. Christ has already been tried. He's already been proven that he's a faithful savior. He's already been proven that he endured the wrath of God. He's already been proven that he's risen from the dead. He's already been proven that God has now made him the head of the corner. He's already been proven that he is the Lord of the universe. He's already proven that he's the king of glory. Y'all follow what I'm saying? So the confidence that the believer has is not that when Christ is tried, Christ was tried. And he has passed the test of being tried. And then he's viewed to us as a what kind of cornerstone? Precious. Yeah, think that one through. Precious. The idea is valuable in our own eyes. He's valuable in God's eyes, but is he valuable in your eyes? When Christ is valuable as he ought to be in your own eyes, you won't let anything dislodge you from him as the source of your foundation and hope. Y'all follow what I'm getting at? There's no way that a man or a woman can properly know Christ in a saving way and abandon him for 30 pieces of silver. It just won't happen. You understand what I'm getting at? It just won't happen. And so it appears to me, quite frankly, the way that Christ is talking to the church at Laodicea, the vast majority of them in that church were never truly born again. Do you hear me? The va if his assessment is that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, and I, I counsel you to buy of me gold trod in the fire, that means that most of them just went through a form of godliness. They put on a facade. And then once the trial came, they exposed themselves as to never having Christ as their ultimate foundation for existence. In this sense, here's what I want to say to you. And we said this last week. I want to say it again. The best thing that can happen to you and me is that we can be tried in this life so that we won't have to be tried in the life to come. The best thing that can happen to you and me is to be exposed for not having Jesus as our hope. So when a trial comes, you discover you can't pray. And the trial comes and you discover that you can't run to God's word. And a trial comes and you discover that you can't remember the precepts of scripture because that's what the Holy Ghost does. He brings into remembrance the things that Christ has said. And when the trial comes, you discover that you have more fear than faith. And the trial comes that you discover that you're starting now to contemplate going back to where you were. That's good. Because that's reality. Now you are walking in a false narrative. Do you understand what I stated? Now, if you and I are loving to walk in a false narrative, that's another evidence you're lost. Because what 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is teaching us, which is the condition of the world today, all these people talking about being this, that, and the other thing, and we know they're not. And they're becoming now even more vociferously aggressive around wanting us to believe that they're this, that, and the other thing. And we know they're not. It indicates that they do not have a love for the truth. That they might be saved. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? 
If a person is operating out of a false narrative, that's one thing. We can be deceived. The devil can get you. It got Mama Eve for a minute. God hunted her down and he had Adam and Eve to admit that they were wrong. And he fixed it, right? If you confess your sins, he is just and faithful. Because that's what our text is. One of the solutions is he'll cover you. But if you perpetually lie about who you are when you're lying about who you are and you continue to lie about who you are when you're not who you say you really are or as God made you to be, then you love lies. You have no love for the truth. That's the generation that I'm preaching to and, and working with today. Do you understand what I'm getting at? God show us where we're messed up and give us grace to admit it. And then give us grace to actually depend upon your counsel, because here it is. Not only is him calling us to believe in the beauty and the splendor and the worth and the wealth of the commodity of Christ's death. Look at sub point D. He says in verse 17, buy of me gold tried in the fire in order that you may be rich with the wealth and riches of Christ and white raiment that you may be what? Clothed. This is a beautiful splendor. He's, a, he's speaking to and answering all of the negatives that were in the analysis given before. You're poor. You can be rich in Christ. You're naked. You can be clothed in Christ. And the beauty of this is I want to draw this home. We talked about this a little earlier. Christ is the only one that can cover your sinful nakedness. And when he covers your sinful nakedness, it is a, a phenomenal experience because what it brings about is peace in your conscience. Remember, Adam and Eve are what? Running because they're naked. And the vast majority of human beings are running or hiding behind false narratives. But when God comes in the truth and exposes us for our false narrative, now we have no place to hide. Once again, we are under the trepidation of the guilt of our conscience, are we not? All right, because now I thought my fig leaves were adequate, but they're not. I thought my false narrative of me having a job and me having a PhD and me operating in a business and me being black and me being a woman and me being this because these are all false pseudo savior narratives today. Did y'all get what I just stated? False pseudo savior narratives. But when the Holy Ghost comes and obliterates those false pseudo savior narratives, now all you have now is to ask God to solve your problem. And he's willing to do that. You know how he does it for the sinner? Close them in the righteousness of his son. What a beautiful overture of God's care for you and me. And there are two fundamental principles out of it I want you to get. First of all, the God of the Bible exposes and covers his people in order that they might walk in a true narrative. All you see in the Bible is God coming along. Say, hey, you, you're naked. We can fix that. Isn't that the way he works? And he comes along with a solution. And what is the solution? To cover them. Genesis 3.21. And he clothed them. Genesis chapter 9. And the sons of Noah went back and covered their father's nakedness. And Joseph's mother made for him a coat of many colors of which he wore to cover from the neck to the feet, which was a great emblem of the righteousness of Christ, by which when he came into prominence as the king of Egypt, she prophesied by that covering. It was the reason for which Joseph and his brother were in conflict, because his brothers didn't, his brothers were really just all messed up about mama giving him that fur coat. But she was spiritual, and she understood that Joseph was the one that would be preeminent and reign. So covering is all through the Bible, is it not? And the idea of being covered in Christ's righteousness carries two connotations. And I want you to see this one. The first connotation that I want you to get out of this is that this covering is a divine initiative on God's part to create a provisional state of eternal righteousness by covering you and I in the righteousness of Christ. When you and I are saved by the grace of God, we are called the very righteousness of God in him. Are we not? Second Corinthians 5.21. To be clothed in Christ's righteousness means for you to stand secure before God as if you were Christ. Stay with me now. But to also be clothed in God's righteousness means that you admit that you are operating in the simultaneity of being righteous and sinful. See, you can't lie 
and say that you're not a sinner. If what God did for you in the first stage of salvation is to cover you. Am I making some sense? Right. You cover your kids and they're covered and the covering becomes your identity marker. But the truth is, is that the external covering points to the righteousness of Christ in order that we might tell men and women, the covering that you see is not my covering, it's his covering. If you saw who I really am in myself, what you would see is a sinner. Am I making some sense? I can't lie. I can't lie. And therefore, as the child of God, I am simultaneously what? Righteous and what? Sinful. So now what I can do with this covering with which he has covered me is use this as an opportunity to point to Christ and not me. And in that, Isaiah 63 says, these are children who will not lie. Thank you, Lord. You gave me enough grace to tell the truth. That my standing is in Christ. That my covering is by the righteousness that he won for me at Calvary. That my confidence is that God sees me in Christ. But that my hope is one day that what I am on my own inside will be permanently and perfectly changed. So right now I experience the provisional covering of Christ's righteousness waiting for the permanent consummation of his glory. Did y'all get that? So it's two stages. One is what I am in Christ and the other is what I will be through Christ and with Christ when he comes again on that last day. That's the hope of the gospel for the believer. See, now when you operate with that framework, watch this now. When you operate with the framework of who you are in Christ, you're not going to be quick to sell your identity. When you operate with this framework of who you are in Christ, watch this. Your hope for glory and that perfect state of glorification with him will not easily be sold by the propositions of this world, which all I can sell you in this life is a few hours of measly blessings which will rot and perish in the judgment on the last day. In other words, it is essential for you and I as children of God to see glory right at our fingertips and live with that as a priority of our lives over against all of the hordes and floods of propositions and temptations coming after us every day. Every day we're being tempted. Every day we're being tried to sell Jesus for the narrative of this world. But when you can see glory, well, I mean, when you can see glory, when by the tiptoe of faith, you can look over the fence and see glory. You say, no, you can have this world in a minute. I will pass through this thin veil into the reality of what my soul knows to be true about eternity. And therefore, I love not my life unto the death. Am I making some sense? And this is what you and I have to hear all the time. You, you and I have to hear this all the time. This is the same message that Abel had to hear. Enoch had to hear. Noah had to hear. Abraham had to hear. We have a city whose builder and maker is God. Made with our hands, eternal in the heavens. The narrative that I'm fighting against in this wicked world of falsehood and lies is that there is no heaven and there is no hell. That's a lie. That there is no God and that there is no devil. Let me help you. The, the work of the devil is to get men and women to think two things that are false. One is that there is no God. Do you understand that? That's, that's the thing that's moving our whole nation right now. A godless Marxism. Do you hear me? The goal of the devil is to get people to think or act like there is no God. Here's the second thing that he's doing. To get people to think and act that there is no devil. You got that? As long as there's no devil and there's no God, it's just us. Y'all hear me? And you better work with that because these are important axioms. When you hear people arguing and talking about solutions in this world and it discounts God, well, you know they're ignorant. But when they also discount the devil, you know they're demonic. 
And it's important for you to know. I keep telling people, it's not what they say, it's what they don't say that you got to hear. It's what you and I got to understand. So yeah, we want God's counsel. We want Christ to counsel us. Yeah, we want to buy out the gospel. We want to buy it and sell it out. Yeah, we want to value the commodity of Christ's death as being infinitely more worth anything that this world can even imagine. And yes, we want to be covered in the righteousness of our Savior because when once we are covered in the righteousness of Christ, we will never, ever be ashamed again. Never, ever ashamed again. I want to be clothed in this righteousness legitimately now so that I can affirm that clothing in the day when he comes again. That's the whole language of First John, that I might not be ashamed when he comes. Oh, that I might be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness, which is of God by faith in Jesus Christ. That righteousness that God approves of and will never, ever reject for all eternity. Grant me, oh God, to run this race, putting behind those things that don't matter, pressing toward the mark of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. Give me the grace to lay hold of Christ. And in the process, say no to everything that looks like or even smells like hell. No! Yes. See, that's the battle we got. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's got to be fierce. I'm sorry. The devil loves to take polite people and bring them into bondage and to drag them. Shh, don't say anything. Shh, come here. Let me put the handcuffs on me. Shh. Hey, Lord, help. He's coming after me. Deliver me. Scream and shout and get serious about being delivered. All right, see, because the enemy loves to get in your head and get you to get silent. That's how the molester works. That's how the pervert works. That's how the devil, shh, and just drag you off. You better scream. You better scream. You can't help yourself. You're trying to help yourself. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You don't have any strength in yourself. You don't have the ability to overcome self-deception, let alone the workings and power. And he shall send them a strong delusion, a strong delusion. Please hear the language. It's a working of error. Literally in the grammar, it's a working of error. A work, God shall send them a strong delusion. He will give them over everything they need to continue going down the wrong path. And they will swear they're on the right path. On the wrong path, let's all get up. Do you hear me? Their logic is bad. Their reasoning is bad. Their worldviews are bad. Their whole approach is flawed. It's carnal, desperate. It's just, it's just amazing how obvious it is to anyone that can be objectively look back and realize this is madness. This is madness. And the world is buying into it. And politicians are collapsing. And, and teachers are collapsing. And, and authorities are collapsing under it. But I should not be surprised. The Lord told me. He told me when he removes the restrainer, men and women are going to be taken in by that strong delusion. And it's happening right before our eyes. I shouldn't be surprised at that, and you shouldn't either. And then finally, here's what he says. He says, not only I counsel you to buy of me gold trod in the fire that you may be rich, white raiment that you may be clothed, that your shame may not be made manifest before all, but anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may what? Ah. So that's, what's going on right now with us at Grace? Because I, I, do you, I, you have a pen? Because I'm getting ready to give it to you. You need this. You need a pen because we're going to close right here with this. I need you to write down three modes of counsel that I want you to follow over the course of this week so that this Friday when we deal with the anti-racist narrative and I unpack the importance of you comprehending the gospel because the gospel is being attacked by an anti-racist narrative and I want you to see the folly of it. What's going to help you clearly see the folly of it are the three videos I want you to see now. I need you to see them. I need you to see them. I wish I had time to talk to you about how to put parameters on what you see because there's a, a lot of BS out there, a lot of crap that's not even worth watching. 
Sometimes you are watching stuff that just has no foundation in reality. I, I would say don't waste your time with anything that is kind of uh, conspiracy theory oriented that doesn't have its roots in concrete facts and analysis and data. A lot of people get sidetracked by that crap. But I'm, I'm going to share something with you with which if you watch these in sequence <clears throat> and then you catch up with me Friday because two more Fridays I'm going to be working through this. Because I want us to have a vision. I want us to be able to see what God sees. I want us to be able to see God and I want to be able to see the enemy because God says we know his wiles. We know his methods. We know his workings. And if I know his wiles, his methods and workings, I won't be deceived. And because he's given me an imperative, do you know what that imperative is? Be not deceived. That's an imperative. That's not an option. That's not an option. He's told me, don't you be deceived, which tells me I can. I can. And I know I can. I haven't been deceived on so many micro levels. It's not even funny. The cleansing of a corrupt vision. He says here in verse 18. Put on ointment on your eyes. Anoint your eyes with eye salve. The eye salve that God gives is his word. The eye salve that God gives is his spirit. The eye salve that God gives is his gospel. The eye salve that God gives is Christ. Got that? The word, the gospel, it's Christ and his spirit. All of those are modes by which revelation comes. It's the spirit that quickens. Christ is the revelator. The word of God gives us understanding. Is that not true? All right, so we, what we need is the eye salve of biblical truth working by the Spirit of God, revealing Christ to us as the supreme revelation of our soul on a continual basis. I need to constantly see Christ. If I see Christ constantly, I'll see the enemy for who he is. The enemy without and the enemy within. Here's how I want to finish with. I want you to actually take down a website. The first one. The title is The End of Europe. The End of Europe. The person that's speaking is going to be Douglas Murray. The End of Europe by Douglas Murray is actually a book by Douglas Murray who happens to be an Englishman. I really appreciate this brother. Now, he ain't black, so when I use the word brother, I'm just talking about common humanity, all right? I appreciate him. And I'm going to tell you after you watch it why I appreciate him, because you're going to be, uh, you're going to be surprised. But Douglas Murray will be doing an interview about a book that he wrote called The Death of Europe by the Hoover Institute. And I need you to write Hoover Institute, because he does different YouTube Events, But this is the one I want because the conversation between him and the uh, scholar at the Hoover Institute lays out this dilemma that we're dealing with very clearly in simple terms that will help you. That's the first one. The second one is called the madness of the crowd. The madness of the crowd by the same Douglas Murray. Only time, the, only, only this time the interviewer is a guy named Joe, J-O-E, it's called Joe. Joe will actually be talking about Douglas S. Murray's second book. <clears throat> now think about those two words. I got one more I want to share with you. The end of Europe is really the end of America before it comes to America. When you hear him talk about the end of Europe, you're going to have an eerie feeling that you're there and you're going to go, whoa. And when you hear him explain his analysis of the madness of the crowd, you're going to go, Pastor Jesse, been telling us this for the last couple months because he, he clearly deconstructs it. Rational man, logical man, not emotional. You're going to be surprised about his self-confession though. And it's going to teach you something about the Imago Day, And I need you to know that too. I need you to know that because one of the things that I want my, the people at Grace to be able to do is overcome what is called genetic fallacies. 
You know what a genetic fallacy is? No, you don't. Yes, you do. No, you don't. Yes, you do. Well, in one sense, the genetic fallacy is the crap that's driving the battle going on in our present generation around racism. And if you don't know what a genetic fallacy is, then you can't identify the fundamental error in this systemic racism argument that's going on. I talked about it last Friday, though. Right? So it's a lot for us to learn. And, and for you and I to have vision, you know what we have to have? Knowledge. You can't see if you don't know. If you're too lazy to learn, you cannot see. It's not going to do enough to feel. That's what the world is doing, feeling. The believer has to be studious. So the second one is the madness of the crowd. He unpacks why the crowd is mad. I love it. And then the last one is called the Evergreen State College. Write it down because you want, you want to see this one. I was um, contemplating which order did I want you to see these in because the Evergreen State College is going to put you smack dab in the middle of what I call the Petri dish of experimentation with young people who enter into college that are taught the very things that are happening in our culture right now. And it's going to be very alarming, the Evergreen State College slash grievance studies. Grievance, like the grieving of a person, studies. And I thought, don't let them see this one first because it's going to unnerve you. And this is a real documentary. It's not like some kind of made up stuff. It's going to unnerve you when you see it because you're not going to believe that students would do this. But it's a logical outcome of this godless system that we're warning about that it's called neo-Marxist cultural revolution. That's been taught for 60 years in our colleges, in our high schools, now it's going to our elementary schools. And I want you to see, because I want you to see how that when God says, why doth the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? It's because they're unhinged from reality. And if you've ever been around a group of people that are unhinged from reality, you are around animals, intellectually. Because animals that are caught up in the frenzy of an emotional moment are not rational. And therefore you can't talk to them. And the goal of the enemy is to get men and women to be so irrational that they can't be spoken to. Because, see, it's the gospel that saves. Propositional truth entering into the mind, bringing men and women back to the Imago Dei so that they can think through where they are. But if the goal of the enemy can turn you into beasts, you can't hear. Am I making some sense? You can't hear the truth of the gospel. And so, the end of Europe... Douglas Murray, the madness of the crowd, Douglas Murray, and the Evergreen State Grievance College and its uh, Grievance Studies, uh, and it's all YouTube. All these are YouTube, so they're all easy to watch, and they're not that long. And uh, this will prepare you for our next level of exposure of this apostate generation in which we are in to help you understand the formidable task you have of making sure your election and calling so that you can stand in the midst of this wicked world. Everything the Bible said would come to pass is coming to pass. The word of the Lord is right. All his works are done in truth. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me, Jesus said. Another they will not follow. But the sad reality is we don't know who God's sheep are until the clarion sound of the gospel is set forth, which divides the sheep from the goats. And the big depiction is, is that the vast majority, the broad road to destruction, is the path upon which the reprobate is on. You and I are getting ready to find out whether or not we really believe this thing. Father, thank you for the saints.
who have come up under your word today. Thank you for your word. You told us that there is a time coming in which men would not endure sound doctrine, but heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they would turn their ears from the truth to myths. And that's where we are. So give your people the boldness to study, the boldness to learn, to discern, and to walk in the confidence of the grace of God in Christ, to love you, to love one another, and be strategically wise as serpents and gentle as doves. And you might give us a stay of judgment. We don't know. So we're praying for a revival. Because that's the only real way this, this nation can turn around. So I'm praying for that. I want that, Father, for my kids. I want it for my grandkids. I want it for my great grandkids. I want to stay, oh God, of your judgment and wrath upon humanity for the purpose of the spreading of the gospel for the next several decades so that others can be saved. But you will have your way because you're God all by yourself and you're glorious in it. And we are not your counselors. As we go our way, give us traveling mercies and prepare our hearts to be ready to study the rest of the week. Speak to us, O God, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, you guys, have a great day. We'll see you guys online on Tuesday. What are the three Marxist uh, documents you want to read? The Communist Manifesto. You're way behind if you are following us. This week, we're dealing with the Communist Confession of Faith. The Communist Confession of Faith, because this is a religion. And the final one is the Communist Demands. If you can read both of those before Friday, it'll help you.